I can still see direct hits on six to eight thousand pounds of bombs of ships of kids that I knew. I don't think that's ever going to go away. I don't think so. Off we go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sun. My name is George Carmack. I was a uh, captain in what was then the U.S. Army Air Corps, and I've been asked to relate to you some of the authentic activities of a thing called World War II. You may have heard of it, it was in all the papers. I'll be 96. October 7th. I was called into duty August 22nd of 41. My job as a ground officer was kind of babysitting the mechanics that were servicing the, the planes for the aviation cadets. Checking shower walls, making sure coke machines were, were full. Well, I was always interested in airplanes and we used to make model airplanes wind them up and let them fly around after a period of time I got uh, got very bored and uh, then I had uh, applied for pilot training that cured my <laughs> cured all <of> my uh, <laughs> boredom <laughs> in a hurry well here we are an old friend you'll remember from flying school days. And I went to uh, pre-flight at Santa Ana, went to uh, primary flight training at Oxnard, California. The primary was pretty much could you hack it or not. Quite a lot of them were washed out in primary. I nearly washed out uh, from a different reason. Some of my buddies uh, flying instructors were uh, had been killed, so I was always more cautious, I guess, and a lot of these kids that didn't know what could happen. I was about to wash out in basic. One of the guys I used to drown a few horns with uh, uh, said, "I'm giving you your wash out." or your past flight, you and I are going to be the only ones around there. He said, for God's sake, don't wreck the plane or we'll have to walk home. <laughs> so out there alone and nobody else, I, you know, it was easy. I had applied for a twin engine, the um, B-25 and, and the A-20 had a nose cannon that the pilot could shoot, which appealed to me. <laughs> I know that I wasn't a good enough pilot to be a, a fighter pilot or an escort pilot, but uh, that was pretty close. But the big push was on to bomb. Um, All 12 planes dropped a total of 37,000 pounds of bombs. We went to uh, Savannah, Georgia. We were getting a new B-17 to deliver to uh, England. The first thing they did was have you make out your will. <laughs> and then the Lockheed representative was there, Boeing, and he said, you know, I used to feel like I was talking to a bunch of dead men, but he says, I think you have a fair chance of maybe making it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, pal. <laughs> that was before fighter escort. So the difference between life and death was the fighter escort. After leaving this new 17 in Wales, then we were assigned to whatever group had lost aircraft and needed replacement crews. I was replaced with the 452nd Bomb Group, 731st Bomb Squadron. We called our 
who captain and the kids, I was the captain. They were all so young that they were kids, gunners, 18 years old. As a replacement crew, you got the oldest beat up plane that there was. The uh, most famous, most notorious ship was Smokey Liz. When I got it, it had some trauma like five times in a row, never made it to a target. The overall plan was to deprive the uh, enemy of gasoline and ball bearings, which were part of munitions and tanks and that sort of thing, and an armament. First mission was, we call it a milk run, it was to hit these launching sites, which we did, and it was easy. Second mission was uh, one of the worst tar targets in Europe. I had a, an agreement with my co-pilot that we would trade off in 15-minute uh, intervals. We were on this long run to the uh, oil refinery and brand new and I was flying in the slipstream of the of the the uh, ships above us in formation and I thought I'm just not physically up to this because we're fly we were flying in prop wash most of the way and uh, we we were almost to the initial point uh, and my my co-pilot was flying his 15 minutes and we look out this oil refinery and there's a whole county of, of flak this was burst black shells I looked over and my co-pilot was kind of wall-eyed and I looked up and we were right under the ship above us with the bomb bay doors open. So I grabbed a thing and we ripped out of there and ripped back in and I said, I got her. <laughs> we got lots of holes, but no, no problem. And that was uh, a great indoctrination to uh, <laughs> welcome aboard, you know. So, like who needs it? <laughs> this is uh, an escape photo that Everybody had in an escape kit. They had this jacket, and uh, everybody in the in the group had their picture taken for this escape information. They would uh, fabricate necessary credentials to go with the picture, but they really were all for naught because. The Germans, would, when they saw the coat, they know exactly what group you were from. <laughs> so that's me escaping. <laughs> well, anybody that said he wasn't scared is a damn liar or a uh, idiot. I don't know of anybody, in honesty, who wasn't scared to death. I tell them I was the had the distinction of of being the scaredest four-engine pilot in Europe. <laughs> Came close to it. <laughs> this Bill Mendel here, he was a waste gunner, that's a side. <clears throat> and we went through some really heavy flak at one of the deep penetrations. I think it was at a uh, gasoline manufacturing plant deep in, the, in the Germany and they just hit us with everything, all kind. You look at it and you think, nobody could possibly get through that. And so I had a, a range with the, the kids when I started to fly on I, I, I would I'd say, we're gonna have pilot to crew, crew check. And we start at the, at the tail, because you, if somebody didn't answer, maybe they, became unhooked from the oxygen 
we were usually up around 30,000 feet and, or you didn't know if somebody had been hit and uh, so we went uh, pilot to crew, crew check and a t t uh, tail gunner says tail gunner okay and uh, one waist gunner on one side said okay and then we called Bill and no answer. So I said, somebody check Bill, see if he's okay. And he had been bending over, looking out the window and, you know, following with his gun, 50 caliber machine gun. And um, he was so scared that he began to sweat profusely. And he was reached back and into his flying suit, and he thought he was bleeding, <laughs> bleeding. <laughs> July 28th, 44, lead ship going down after a flash hit near Leipzig, the refinery. The uh, worst target in Europe was uh, Luna Synthetic Oil Works, a refinery that was way in in uh, a county called Holly, and uh, knowing that we would be after that, they just moved more guns in there than you can imagine. He looked at it and said, God, nobody could get through that. They pumped any aircraft shells smack up to our altitude. And of course, with experience, we found that the black smoke puffs were exploded shells that don't hurt you. It's the white blinkers in there that, that do the damage. And you can feel, feel the hits in the ship uh, going through the metal in your plane. This is my co-pilot, Lloyd F. Blake from Seattle, Washington. Uh, he saved us one day. Uh, he had a, practically a cigarette in his mouth every waking moment, it seemed like. We got our defroster shot out at about 30,000 feet, and the inside of the cab frosted over so we couldn't see. And he had his trusty uh, Zippo lighter in his pocket. <laughs> so he would uh, melt a little place in the, in the windshield till we, we finally got down to where it, it just uh, melted naturally. And, uh, but um, it was pretty exciting for a while uh, because uh, we weren't exactly sure where the rest of the guys were. <laughs> I never got a plane of my own to name. The plane that I inherited from this guy from Flatbush Avenue was, was Flatbush Fluji. This is a picture of my ship taken by a buddy of mine. He said, pull over and I'll take your picture. So we slid over. They had uh, mom and two of my friends had a, a picture of this painted on the wall in the office down there. On our, and uh, I'm very proud of that. Intercity drop that had a code name Zebra Mission and it was to supply canisters full of medicines, munitions, food, all kind of things to the free French that are uh, operating in the French Alps. There was a field, open field, pretty good size up in the 
a mountaintop, and uh, they built a big bonfire at the top to guide us in to where to drop. And uh, so we were right on the, right on the mountaintop, right on the ground virtually when we went in and dropped that. I thought, boy, if there's, <laughs> if there's three fighters around here, we're meat, you know. People out in the country in, uh, in France were very appreciative. And they would come up and thank you, thank you, thank you, and that sort of thing, which made us feel good. A means of, uh, of uh, kind of making you forget everything was booze. And uh, when, when you knew you weren't going to fly the next day, why well, it, got, it got very wet. Once a month, the whole group was stood down, and they'd go into Norwich, which was the nearest big town, pick up a bunch of awful-looking babes. There was one that had orange hair and one that had purple hair, and it took a while for the guys to get drunk enough to dance with them, but this guy, uh, Frank Kurtz, he was a real jiver, you know, and I'd throw him over the shoulder and all that and spin him. And one or the other, I don't know where it was, the orange hair or the purple hair, never wore any pants. <laughs> so, so he would spin her around, you know, and to the cheers of the, the drunks. <laughs> Well, at the time that I was so exhausted, I was, I was wondering if I could physically go on. I was coming home from dinner one night. I had probably uh, too many uh, refreshments. And all of a sudden, I felt an urge to throw up and uh, there was headlights right behind me, and, and it was our squadron surgeon. And they said, what's with him? And they said, well, I said, boy, he's getting really jumpy. I said, oh, good. Well, I'll give you a seven-day pass at the flak farm, <laughs> which was over on the, on the west side of England there, the um, Irish Sea. Big old hotel was taken over for kids to go there and relax a little. Where our bombers were to proceed west to the target. You're in danger all the time, but usually uh, there would be a little evasive action that you could take. I think probably one of the scariest moments, and uh, it was all over before I was gone, but with a heartbeat, we could have we, we could have been rammed by a, a ship. We went way deep, about as far as we could go, <clears throat> and we were trying to uh, climb above a, a cloud deck. We tried to stay in tight and, and get, get back out of the, the, uh, the fog where we could see. And, uh, we had some new guys on our right wing, and uh, the top turret gunner says, let down, boss, about like simultaneously. <laughs> They're both screaming. The ball turret gunner says, pull up, boss. <laughs> and then this guy goes, Whoosh! just passed by. He spins out uh, and just passed our tail, you know. That probably was as close to getting rammed as as I was in the whole tour. All right, left arm first. Combat spurs many things. For luck. Like religion and left. You're in there and you came home uh, clean and you said, hey, I put my left 
sock in my left shoe and my left boot on left first yesterday and I made it home. Beautiful. So don't change it. Don't get off a winning horse, you know. And I've been doing that ever since and I'm still here. I uh, got to be one of the luckiest guys alive. My group was never hit by fighters on any day that I was out. And I've, we've had groups in front of me and behind me that were hit. Our groups that were hit on days that I was on leave. So how do you explain that? My bombardier, Mr. Trogsnack, the uh, bombardier sits out there in that, that, that glass nose, plexiglass nose, and he's looking down, and, which is an exciting place to be. And uh, some flak came through his plexiglass nose, and a little sliver of it went into just the skin on his arm up here. The navigator, baby face, was all over him. <laughs> Had him all cleaned up and one thing and another. And we used to laugh, he's the only one that got hit and uh, the only one that got a purple heart for wounded. So this is my, my dis distinguished flying cross. I wasn't very distinguished, but I was but I finished. <laughs> so they, they gave you that for completing a tour. I flew my first mission on July 5th. I flew my 35th mission on uh, November 10th, right before Armistice Day. I, I think that it's pretty close to a record. I just let it be known that I, I wanted to fly and hopefully get the hell out of there. <laughs> Initially, the, uh, the tour was 25 missions, and um, practically nobody had done that. Then it was up to 30. By the time I got there, they had up to, to 35 missions. <laughs> so look out. I'm the only uh, surviving member of my crew. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I certainly would want to do it again. Not that I could, but I um, made a lot of wonderful friendships and uh, sharing this experience makes bonding even greater than family. There just isn't any way to replace the uh, Comradery or the uh, of that intense, close feeling of having experienced the same traumas, you know. With the wrong set of circumstances, uh, I can have a nightmare, and uh, still any night, the uh, vision of some friend going up in smoke. Uh, I'm sure will never go away. I uh, couldn't be happier to have lived this long for a lot of the guys that I've seen weren't able to, weren't able to have a wonderful family and uh, prosperous enough to have four great kids, children, that we were able financially to all put through college. And um, I'm ready. I'm ready to get out of here. <laughs> Hell, I'm 95 years old now. So, so how long how long do you expect? <laughs> Off with one hell of a roar We live in fame or go down in flame Nothing can stop the Army Air Corps <laughs>